everybody, and welcome to the Plant Ninja podcast. Today, we got an awesome guest, Taylor DeBoer um, with TD Nutrition, and we're going to have a talk. We're just going to learn about all of her incredible insights. She has a master's in, a, is it applied nutrition? Is that what it is? Yes, applied nutrition and health coaching. Yeah. Okay, amazing. And she's got a lot of experience in this realm. And um, I first uh, discovered Taylor on the old Instagram, and I just started looking at some of her content, and I was... Uh, excited to see that basically like almost word for word, we have a, a lot of the same recommendations and have had a, uh, a similar journey with our, our uh, plant-based diet, et cetera. And so it's just a, a great opportunity to have a talk with somebody who not only is living the life, but also has a, a extensive uh, education in the actual nutritional sciences. So that's what I'm excited to talk about today. Thanks so much for joining me, Taylor. Um, and my first question for you is, uh, I would just love to hear a bit about your 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 journey into a plant-based diet and how you were able to overcome Lyme disease. Yeah, so um, it was the Lyme disease that caused me to journey into a plant-based diet um, prior to being diagnosed with Lyme disease. Um, I never really ate a lot of meat, but I would definitely eat some type of like grass fed ground bison or something for dinner, mostly because it was still kind of in my mind that, well, you know, I need that high protein. I was active and like, you know, I needed meat. There was no way around it. Did I enjoy eating it? Did I enjoy cooking it? Not really. Um, it was just one of those things that I felt I had to do, um, and especially being in the fitness world, um, you know. No one really is super into being plant-based. If you like, or really wanting to get fit and lean, it's all about high protein and obviously from animal sources. Um, and then I started experiencing some, some weird health symptoms. I was getting this, you know, rash on my skin. I had, um, candida problems. I was dealing with PCOS, um, autoimmune markers. There were so many things going on and, I kept kind of asking different doctors, well, why do I have all these problems all of a sudden? Like what is causing it? Like, you know, no one, no one had an answer. They were just thinking, well, it could just be because you have autoimmune and this is just, you know, these are just things you're going to be dealing with. And I wasn't really satisfied with that answer. Um, at the time I was also getting steroid injections to calm my skin down because nothing was working and I was so miserable. Um, and the dermatologist just said, Hey, you know, like every three months or so you might want to come in and get one of these injections just to keep things under control. And I was like, that's no way to continue to live my life. Like I can't keep doing this. Um, so finally, um, one day I was like researching online, like, you know, what type of illnesses could you have a rash with? And, and mono popped up and I had had mono in high school and I had, I was also experiencing extreme chronic fatigue. So I thought, you know what, maybe I'm having like another bout of mono and it's causing my skin to, to do this. So I, I called up my primary doctor and I said, you know, can you order me um, a blood test to get tested for mono? And she, she said, sure, um, let's throw in Lyme disease also, since some of the symptoms are similar. And sure enough, they both came back positive, which is quite common. Many people who have Lyme disease do test positive for mono, which mono is also known as Epstein-Barr virus. Um, and so then at that point, I was like, all right, I want to try to do this as natural as I can. So I, I reached out to a naturopathic physician that I had worked with in the past. She referred me to someone else who could better, who was better equipped with someone with Lyme disease. And so she did another panel and I believe it's called a CD57 panel, but I could be incorrect on that. Um, and I came back with having co-infections. Um, and so she was like, basically, if there's any doubt that you got a false you know, positive with Lyme, like you can put that to rest because you definitely have, have Lyme. Yeah. And um, I was disappointed in the way that she wanted to treat it because then she did go the antibiotic route. And we, I was on antibiotics for 10 months as well as an antifungal medication, which was pretty strong to where strong enough to where we were monitoring my liver enzymes because of the impact it could have had on my liver. Mm. Uh, and after 10 months, I was so fed up. I was like, everything was worse. All of my lab numbers were worse because I had to go in every three months to get blood work done. And everything was a mess. My hormones were imbalanced. I started dealing with acne. I had never dealt with acne before. All of a sudden I'm getting acne, which obviously, you know, you know about antibiotics, they terrible for your gut. So that's 
um, you know, definitely going to contribute to acne. And so I finally was like, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore. I was in my master's program at the time. And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to try to do this nutritionally. I, I don't want to keep taking these antibiotics, everything in me, like when I'd have to take the, the, pill or the capsule, I was like, I can't do this. It just, I, my body didn't even want it. Um, so I 10 stopped. 10 months is a long we, time. Yeah. 10 months is a long time. It's a very long time. And they say, you know, a two week dose of antibiotics takes your gut about two years to fully recover from that because mm -hmm. antibiotics, it's like a forest fire. It burns down everything, all of the good bacteria and all of the bad bacteria. Um, so then when I was like calculating at one point, like, okay, how many weeks are in 10 months? How many years is it going to take me to recover from this? And obviously you can speed that up with nutrition, but it's a very long time. Um, so once I went, you know, when I was going to address, do it nutritionally, that's when I decided to cut out meat because I was trying to be very anti-inflammatory because Lyme disease is inflammatory. And, um, I didn't even want meat. I was researching fruit and, you know, plant-based. And I started realizing that, okay, I could do this without meat. I don't need meat. And odds are I'm going to fare better without it due to having Lyme. And sure enough, I did. And within six months, I felt like myself again. Um, my skin did take a bit longer to heal. Um, cause I was also dealing with like heavy metal toxicity and I had a copper, uh, copper IUD, the cop, the non-hormonal copper IUD. And that was causing some toxicity in my body. Um, but I started feeling like myself pretty quickly after just focusing on diet and getting off the medications. And I was like, why didn't I do this sooner? And at this point it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm totally sold on, on being plant-based because it, it definitely worked for me and worked for, for my Lyme disease. So. Wow. That's incredible. Uh, and so whenever you, whenever you, uh, say that you started to adjust the diet, I hear that you removed meat and animal products from the diet. What kind of other kind of changes did you make, um, from your previous intake? Yeah. So aside from removing animal products, I cut out caffeine. I was a huge caffeine addict. Like I would do coffee in the morning, pre-workout afternoon coffee, and then a Celsius in the evening before like my evening cardio. I, I was working out just way too much and running on caffeine. Um, I did a lot of protein shakes as well. So I cut those out and I really became very, very um, nitpicky about ingredients labels and reading what's in foods and trying to avoid preservatives, you know, artificial sweeteners, things like natural flavors. Um, and I was just so focused on just doing high fruit um, because mm. intuitively I was like, it just clicked in my brain. And I was like, that sounds right. Like that feels right within every fiber of my being. And mm. so I focused on that after cutting all the bad stuff out and tried to just keep it, you know, nothing out of a package too, for a while. Like, you know, not that I do anything out of a package now, but you know, maybe like obviously rice or something comes in a package, but um, I was very adamant about being as, you know, minimally processed and whole foods as possible. Right. Amazing. And where do you, where are you with uh, caffeine now? Do you still abstain from caffeine? Do you need do any cacao or anything like that? Um, I don't do cacao maybe once in a blue moon. I'll, I'll add it to something. I don't, I'm not really a big, like, chocolatey person I never really have so mm -hmm. that's not too difficult for me every now and then I'll do a decaf coffee like if it's warm and I want like an iced coffee I'll do a decaf um, I make sure it's naturally decaffeinated a lot mm -hmm. of decaf coffee is caffeinated or decaffeinated using like a chemical based yeah, process sure. um, so I'll do that once in a while but you know that's like months every you know every few months yeah so. yeah yeah that's amazing and i think so many people don't actually realize that the caffeine itself is a is a is a toxin in order to keep pests from eating the plant and stuff so it definitely does have a a taxing effect on the body totally yeah amazing so yeah the next question i i have for you is that and if this is something that um it's kind of funny to say is like that <clears throat> There in the plant-based world, there are a few different types of niches. There's like the fully raw, which people are pretty, a lot of times very much like all or none sort of thing, hundred percent raw. And yeah. then there's the whole food plant-based, which is lots of cooked grains, cooked starches, cooked uh, vegetables, et cetera. And then somewhere in between there, which is like where you and I fall is this high raw, high fruit with some cooked, cooked foods in there, which is something we relate upon. What is your perspective on adding a little bit of cooked foods in the diet? Uh, I, 
I'm a huge advocate for it. I think just, you know, with the time we live in that just having some element of cooked food tends to work for most people. Um, especially, you know, a lot of people don't live where it's warm all year round. And so as that weather just changed and start getting colder, the body starts craving those cooked comfort foods. Um, and so I think that you can still achieve really great and optimal health with some cooked food and doing, doing high raw. Um, cause I do think that there's benefit to things like potatoes, which you obviously can't really eat potatoes raw. Um, and so, you know, I, I find that most of my clients fare the best with some cooked food in their diet and doing high raw. But then again, like I said, that also is because they tend to live in a place where there are seasons versus if you do live somewhere tropical, um, I could totally see the, um, kind of, you know, the lure to, to be raw all the time, because if it's warm out and I experienced that myself in the summertime, I'm not craving cooked food at all. Dinner time rolls around. I'm like, I, you know, I'll make myself a salad or a wrap or just do a bunch of fresh veggies and dip them in like a salsa or guacamole. Uh, cooked food doesn't even really cross my mind when it's warm, but when the weather changes, it does. And I'm, I come dinner time. I do, I want something um, cooked. And I don't, I, I don't think that it's detrimental to our health in any way. Obviously, yeah, like you said, there are diff different niches of, of eating plant-based and, and some people are very adamant on like no cooked food at all. But I, I think that your body can absolutely heal incorporating cooked foods um, and doing, you know, a lot of uncooked foods at the same time. Yeah, awesome. So yeah, my my kind of take on that is is very similar. And I, I've been on the journey of being plant-based for 16 years now. Started off fully raw, went kind of whole food plant based for like seven, eight years, which was like lots of cooked grains and beans and things, and then have been uh, basically like 80% raw for the last almost six years now. And it's it just like being able to weigh the differences and um, just the feeling uh, and the freedom of being able to just having variety. And having this like not a really dogmatic kind of perspective on it, but knowing what feels really good, knowing what fuels my body very well. Uh, yeah. And then also in the sense of I, one of my main goals is to help people transition to plant-based diets in the most sustainable way possible. And having that flexibility I find is very helpful. It, I, I do find a lot of merit in, in fully raw and high raw, but I also don't see detriment in, the right amount of cooked food. I did feel more sluggish. I did feel more digestive, um, like more taxed in my digestion yeah. when I did lots of cooked food. And I'd still, whenever I eat a heavy meal at night, yes, it it digests more slower. It's a little bit heavier than the, the, the raw foods, but I still find great merit. And once again, it's about helping people to transition to plant-based diets find that kind of optimal raw to cooked per uh, ratio in there. And if you want to experiment from that foundation, that's really powerful going more raw. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. Yeah. And, and you obviously have a, a lot of, you know, years being plant-based to be able to compare, you know, I've been you've kind of been doing this for like five, six years now. So, you know, a while, but not, not 16 years. So it's neat that you're able to look back on a longer span of time and be like, yes, this, this is kind of the sweet spot. This is where I feel, you know, my best and you can kind of compare. Yeah. Thanks. You, you know, and so, and one more thing to add to that is that I also have five children and it's really important to, to acknowledge and just like honor the these children's need for more variety for more richness there are some families who do fully raw just fine with their kids and stuff and like we were fully raw with our kids for a long time but then as they even got more got older they got more curious they were around our family and stuff they naturally and and when we moved whenever it was winter like you were saying when there was colder times there was a natural yearning for more richness and so Rather than just being super strict and kind of militant about things, we be, we have always chosen to be more flexible um, around their desires and needs. And we find, and naturally, the, the beauty is that they naturally experience the difference between these different types of food. And they naturally gravitate all through the day. It's more fruit. Be raw veggie salads, etc. But then at nighttime, when we all come together, it tends to be something like sweet potatoes, maybe some lentils, some cooked veggies, a salad, something like that. 
So I think it's very good for people to also acknowledge, like honor your children, give variety, you know, yeah. they, they're they going to figure it out. They're going to be fine. Set a good foundation, which we know. Yeah. It, it, and also the feeling of people feeling safe, a whole food plant-based diet, which is the most researched sort of yeah. uh, and supported, you know, uh, resource supported plant-based type of diet that we have right now. So go in there, be safe. Yeah. Go in feeling safe so you can sust sustain it um, and then use that as a foundation and go from there. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's perfect. Yeah. So I love to, one of the, my main recommendations for people, because I, I give people recommendations. I'm like, Hey, if you want to transition to whole food plant-based, like this is how we're going to do it. Um, if you want to experiment more raw all the way to fully raw, these are my recommendations. But the bottom line here is that you're getting the right amount of fat in the diet, because if you go over that, you're going to mess up the metabolism, of the carbohydrates. If you go under that, most people are not going to ever go under that. Um, what from your level of expertise, what is the ideal amount of fat in the diet for most people? And why would you say that is? So for most people, I mean, I would say 10 to 15% of your daily calories. So what is that? It's like 22 to, I don't know, maybe just under 30 grams a day, something like that. Yeah. Um, and obviously, like you said, for like, you know, the right metabolic benefit, you don't want to go too high. Um, and historically speaking, in the 1930s, there was a group of doctors who were treating people with chronic illness, things like kidney disease, diabetes, psoriasis, um, some other, some other health problems. And they use a low fat diet to help them heal. And granted, I do think they took it to a bit of an extreme, but I still think it's great data is they had them consume 2% of their daily calories from fat, which part of me is like, I'm not entirely sure how they kept that so low, because <laughs> even if you're not consuming overt fat sources and you're say, you're just eating fruit, you're still going to probably get five to 10% fat from that alone. So from the fatty acids. Exactly. So I know that they had them eat in during this, when they did the study, they had them eat, they could do fresh fruit, fresh juices. Oddly enough, they were able to do white table sugar. Um, and then they could do white rice and they could have as much of that as they wanted. So I'm wondering if they just were like fruits, fruit juice and like rice diet kind of, mm -hmm. is that pretty uh, Pardon me. Was that the pretty stuff? Um, no, I don't believe so. I, okay. I can't think of the doctor's I'm, name. I'm, off I'm the feeling confused, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. Um, it might be. I, I just remember the doctor's name and I'm blanking right now. It starts with a K. Um, and so anyways, they, you know, they all healed. And, and when they followed up 11 years later, they were still doing great. And especially the, the people who were diabetic, they, you know, didn't need insulin and their blood sugar and everyone see a one C all that was great. Um, so I think that if you're dealing outright with some type of health issue, whether you're like me and you have Lyme disease or you have candida or something going on, I, I think aiming more for that 10% or even around 8% is ideal. If you're, you know, not dealing with any health problems and you're just wanting to achieve, you know, optimal metabolic benefit, I would say, you know, you could do more 15%. Um, I know, I think you advocate for a little bit more than that. Um, which you probably could still even get away with even a little more than 15%. I know that in the 1950s, they changed what constituted a low fat diet. Cause it used to be this universal recommendation of low fat meant 10% of your daily calories. Um, and obviously like Dr. Um, Graham, Doug Graham believes the same. Um, but in the 1950s, the recommendation of what was low fat changed and it, they changed it to 30% of your daily calories. And so when they, when they said low fat, that's what it became, which 30% is even, that's definitely too high. And you're not yeah. going to get any metabolic benefit if you're doing all these carbs. Um, and, um, Dr. Joseph Mercola, who's pretty famous, granted he is a meat eater. And obviously I don't agree with a lot of, um, you know, everything that he talks about, but there's a lot that he talks about that I agree with. And I've slowly, but surely seen him kind of evolve and change with his views on nutrition and he's starting to come over to this high carb, low fat viewpoint. Um, after and making the keto diet famous, after making the keto diet famous and then being like, oh, that shit's actually going to kill you. 
Yes, exactly. I know. But I'm like, okay, this is so neat to see him come around and realize there's actually something to be said. And he, ta he he's talked about how longevity speaking, low fat, high carb is where it's at. And so I'm like, this is so cool to see like more mainstream and, you know, high meat eating, you know, practitioners start to realize like, okay, there is something to be said here. Um, and I do, I think it's because when you look at the metabolic benefit and the healing benefit, like you really can't deny that. So yeah, I know I kind of trailed off your question a little bit. No, no, <laughs> so. no. It's all super relevant. It's all super duper relevant. And and like you're saying, it's like I um so I I got a lot of my information. I've been into the plant based doctors for decade for over a decade. Um, and that led me up to this point. Whenever I discovered uh, maybe six or seven years ago, the mastering diabetes guys, uh, yes. which is uh, Cyrus and Cyrus Kambada and Robbie Bao. I'm gonna forget his name, but. These guys yeah. are, are the the masters when it comes to uh, the biochemistry and uh, because they're both type one diabetics as well. And so um, and the reason why I got really into even studying the fat more was because my stepson uh, was diagnosed with type one diabetes when he was 11. He's 17 now. And so we got really just like, how can we help him? That was part of actually why we went. So we went into the high fruit, low kind of um more raw side of things as a family. And um, my recommendation, yeah, the, their recommendations are around 15% for the most sensitive individuals, which is like type one diab diabetics, et cetera. And that there being a little bit more flexibility, like you're saying with healthy individuals and things like that. And one of the reasons why I recommend, why I set, I say 20% 20 20 calories from fat max is also wanting to accommodate as many people as possible to transition to a whole food plant-based diet. And then from there, I actually teach them how to use chronometer a little bit and be like, okay, look, you know, track what you even look like, look at what a day used to look like, get an idea. And you're like, oh, you're in the 35% fat probably. Now start to do the recommendations. I, I use a, what I call a lean in approach. We're going to lean into the recommendations. You're going to start doing this and this track, um, your intakes, you're going to see, okay, look, you're getting much, you're in that 20% range. That's great. And if you have this craving, you go and you eat some French fries, notice you just from those French fries, you're probably up in the 25, 30% range again. How do you feel for the next two days? And almost like clockwork, they feel uh, sluggish, digestive, digestive distress. They just feel like ick for a couple of days, obviously, because they're not metabolizing the carbohydrates as well anymore. And then that gives them this very tangible, visceral experience. So that 20% is like another one of those sort of platforms or foundations to experiment from. Yeah. If I were to estimate, I'm probably eating in the 15% range most days because I'm doing fruit for lunch, fruit for breakfast most days, and then doing a little bit of cooked food with some walnuts and things at night. Um, but yeah, I think we're like definitely on the same page with that. Thanks so much for sharing your experience and expertise. The next question I have for you is that, uh, as you and I both know, that this is a, an important aspect of, of health and all around. I'd say that like diet is the foundation for people achieving their optimal weight, but then just dialing in everything else, dialing in the met metabolism, obviously building some physique, some agility, um, bone density, uh, you know, lymphatic stimulation, all this amazing stuff. What is your take on exercise? How do you think it contributes to healthy metabolize, metabolism and all around health? Yeah, obviously I'm a huge advocate of exercise. I love fitness. Uh, I always have. And um, it's been fun for me to see my fitness change and evolve as my diet has changed and evolved. Um, and even just going through my, you know, my chronic illness and I kind of got weaker for a while and I had to rebuild strength and being able to rebuild my strength back to the place it was prior to getting sick on little to no protein, you know, um, has been really cool. And I, I think just if, you know, for people's overall health, obviously exercise is super important because yeah, you want good solid bone density and especially, you know, for women, osteoporosis is a huge issue as you get older and lifting weights is one of the best things you could do for bone density, lifting heavy things. And, and it doesn't mean you have to be an avid weightlifter. Um, you know, my mom doesn't love to lift weights, but like she has osteoporosis and I'm like, okay, you need to like be lifting some heavy things like a couple of days a week at least. Um, 
And then just for getting like blood flow and yes, like stimulating your lymphatic system exercise is great for that. And it does help to regulate blood sugar and all of that by exercising. And on top of that, it just makes you feel good mentally. Like it's good for your mental health to work out and move. Um, and most of the time I feel this, I'm sure you feel it. It's like the second you do an exercise, even if it's for like 10, 20 minutes and you've gotten that blood flow a little bit, it's like you already feel so much better about your day and you feel clearer, you know, and not that diet doesn't help your mindset be clear as well, but exercise certainly does in a, in a different way almost. So. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I actually, you know, I tell, I teach people that if you get the, if you actually like, whenever you're getting healthy and like holistic health, it requires um, a shift in the mentality, a shift in that self-care and that self-love enough to start to lean into some exercise. And then when you start to do some exercise, there's a simultaneously uh, improvement in the mental health because you are fortifying yourself with discipline. You are doing things that are I, I call are um, challenging yet life-affirming behaviors. So you're actually... Give it, giving yourself the opportunity and and willing yourself to do a challenging behavior, knowing that the rewards are delayed. And so there's this simultaneous improvement in your physical health and improvement in your mental health. And it's a positive feedback loop also because it you start to eventually, you feel um, like you were saying, you start, you feel amazing after the workouts because you get all these positive endorphins you're getting these good signals for growth in the body your metabolism's improved and then over time you start to see changes in your physique and that's positive feedback you feel really good about that and then you also get this positive feedback of look i'm getting more disciplined look i'm like you have this kind of i i, I call it like riding high like you feel good about yourself for like being up on this kind of health health pro, uh, pattern and all of that also, because you're um, improving the physical body, you're actually improving and fortifying the internal organs with the exercise, with the diet. In Chinese medicine, the, the emotions are correlated with the different organ systems. So it's like you got frustration and anger with the liver, you've got fear with the kidneys, you've got excitement with the heart, melancholy with the lungs. So as you're actually getting the body tuned up, you're actually bringing the emotions more into balance and all in all this is why i point to holistic health i say start with the body like if you're able to cultivate the care and self-love to get into a fitness routine into eating the, those foods this is a positive feedback loop that if you keep on riding that bike that 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 the the health bicycle high then yeah. it, it really positively feeds back into itself for a holistic health outcome Absolutely. yeah that's such a good point. And we're so sedentary today. Most people, you know, it's like, you kind of have to have an exercise regimen. You, I mean, again, nutrition is amazing and that's a huge part of it, but to have like that holistic health that you want, you need to exercise because we just, with technology and everything, we're, we're so like pushed into more sedentary actions and, and our bodies really aren't designed to be sedentary. We need to move them. So you, we need to go out of our way to have a fitness regimen versus, you know, years ago, we were just, naturally active. So maybe you didn't need to carve out time to go to the gym because you were walking 20,000 steps a day just naturally, but it's just not the case anymore. Yeah. A hundred percent. You were walking, you were squatting, you're in the garden, yeah. <laughs> which is all these things that I'm really excited to like reestablish into healthy communities. But as you're saying, it's like, we're definitely in that transition sort of modern period right now. And it's important to, to in, intentionally move. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's just touch this one. Let's just touch quickly on the the protein situation. So it's like one okay. of the most common questions that that we all get. It's like, um, people even when transitioning to a plant based diet are saying are are asking me, should I do protein shakes? Do I need to focus on uh, protein heavy foods, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Would love to hear your feedback on that. Yeah. So I, um, last year I put together like an ebook and I was, I had a lot of fun doing it. And it was basically all about like getting toned and building muscle basically on fruit and talking about protein myths. And what I was determined to do for that is 
and I've, I've since posted it on social media, this part of it is I went through and looked at all the nine essential amino acids, all the nine non-essential amino acids. And I listed every fruit that has that amino acid. And if you look at all of them, you have multiple options of fruit that you can get these amino acids. And obviously there's overlap as well. I think there was one non-essential amino acid that dates only contained that non-essential one. And obviously that's a non-essential, like our body can make that. Um, and the reason we need protein is for the amino acid chains, right? Yeah. So uh, as long as we're getting amino acids, we're going to be fine on the protein front. But, you know, when we look at the protein count of an apple, you know, it's, it's nothing to, that's nothing spectacular. It's not like 20 grams of protein or something crazy like that, that we're used to hearing when we hear those buzz, buzzwords of products like, oh, it has 30 grams of protein. It's healthy. You should eat it. Yeah. Um, so while it doesn't directly have that, the protein count, it has the amino, the amino acid count. Um, and that's, you know, that's why we need protein. So if you're focusing on amino acids, you don't need to worry about the grams of protein per se, because you're going to be getting the amino acids. Um, and so sometimes I'll say to clients, like, like after you work out, don't worry about a protein shake, have an amino acid shake. So just have a grapefruit smoothie and you'll yeah. be covered with all the amino acids. Um, and there's some new, um, evidence coming out that shows even that when it comes to essential amino acids, that if you have a diverse microbiome with lots of good gut flora, that our gut can actually make some of these essential amino acids if it needs it from all the bacteria that we have. And so that goes against everything we thought about essential mm -hmm. amino acids. And while it's still very new, this research, um, the fact that they're starting to discover that that the body is able to do that, I think is very cool. And I also don't find it surprising. Our bodies are incredibly smart. They know what they're doing. And obviously protein is important. I'm not saying it's not important, but our bodies can make proteins from highly nutrient dense foods like fruits and vegetables if it needed to like the fact that we think it somehow can't or the argument against eating plant based is well you can't get complete proteins i'm like our bodies aren't our bodies aren't dumb like mm. <laughs> they can do a lot with what they're given um you know i think just the worst thing you could do is just not eat enough calories or nutrition during the day and then yes your body can't do much with that but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm 100% on page, on the same page with that. In fact, I tell people it's like the human breast milk is between six to 8% total calories from protein. And the uh, what we know is that if you are getting enough calories in your diet from a diversity of plant foods, and we're not even talking about a huge diversity of plant foods, we're just talking about a, a handful of different things then you are yeah. getting enough amino acids um, for a normal, healthy individual. And then, of course, then that's amazing that you're also, I've always said that the body's also very flexible as well. I didn't know about that, that aspect about being able to make the some ascent of the other essential amino acids from the, the gut bacteria. But it, it so much points back to a healthy gut mi microbiome, even in B12 absorption, even in like a, a lot of these other sort of micronutrients that, that um, are a topic. Uh, but yeah, one of the things that I, what was I going to say about the, uh, the protein? <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think pretty much, uh, oh, they, for normal, healthy individuals is what I was saying. So, and then I say, you know, of course, if you're somebody who's going into like bodybuilding, which is not necessarily, right. some, necessarily something I promote. In fact, the way that I talk to people is like, I am, I tell people what I am. I'm six foot one, 162 pounds. I eat fruit most of the day. And this is what I eat at nighttime. No emphasis on protein powders or protein heavy foods. I work out two hours of quality calisthenics per week um, with progressive overload. So I'm, I'm modifying for higher intensity. That's that adding weight sort of thing. Um, and this is what, with that type of diet and that amount of exercise, this is what that builds. You know, yes. it's like, I'm not hungry for protein. No, I'm not a bodybuilder. That's not even what I advocate for. That's not even what I think that is the most longevity producing pattern. But if you do want to go down that route, talk to one of these protein guys, talk to Nimai Delgado or somebody else who, and they'll, t they'll give you their recommendations on protein. And, and yeah, maybe in that case, it, it would help to do a little bit more emphasis on the, the protein heavy foods and some protein powders, et cetera, et cetera. But even on that note, there are some pretty jacked 
all, you know, all fruit guys out there. So just be curious, yeah. go do your yeah. own. Yeah, absolutely. But I do want to point out something you said is that, you know, obviously you're not, you're not preaching to people who want to be bodybuilders, but that's also not really natural. That's not a natural human physique. So like, yes, of course, you're going to have to go out of your way, whether you're plant-based or animal-based to eat more protein, because you're trying to get your body to do something that's not natural. Yeah. So in that, which I don't think we'll go down this route, that gets into the idea of sustainability also. Because yeah. like, if we're actually <laughs> looking at what, where we're going as a as a, a civilization or as a, as a people, yeah. it's like we also have to look at like what is actually, what is natural is also probably what's most sustainable also. And so it's like yeah. if, if you're doing something that requires you to spend a large portion of your life just like moving weights around lifting weights and things and then you're also having to feed yourself extra calories and then you're also having to feed yourself extra protein which a lot of people will tend to go more towards animal protein that's going to be the vast majority of bodybuilders out there and for what other function than vanity you know like right. <laughs> in, in, in you know whatever the athleticism or the the art of bodybuilding for what other function than that um, then in my humble opinion, that's not actually the most long-term uh, intelligent or sustainable sort of route to go. So that that's my, my own thing. I think it's actually good that there are some people out there, and especially in this phase in our in our culture right now, where there are guys out there who are doing the bodybuilding thing on a plant-based diet to say, hey, look, like the body still works with yeah, it can be done. <laughs> sources of protein. The protein doesn't have to come from something, you know, that was sentient or something like that. It's yeah. Like, <laughs> so, um, I think the, you know, we've talked about so much awesome stuff. The last question I have for you is what is your, what are your main recommendations for someone interested in transitioning to a healthy plant-based diet? Um, well, um, I think this is probably, I would imagine probably a recommendation you have as well is start your day with fruit, just your first meal, have it be fruit, all fruit, any fruit you want as much as you want, but start there. Um, and, and it, it, it's always so, I mean, I'm never surprised because I know, but it's still always exciting for me when someone tells me. I started eating fruit for breakfast and I feel so much more energized and I feel better and I feel brighter. And I'm like, that's amazing. I love to hear that. I could hear that a hun a million times and not get sick of hearing that. I think it's, it's great when people have that epiphany. And I think it's because I remember when I had my epiphany with fruit, cause I, I used to fear fruit. I wouldn't eat it. Um, and so I, I get so excited that other people kind of share in that. And, um, you know, I, I, I do. I think fruit is magical. And so it's so neat when other people start to um, grasp that as well. And then, you know, another one of my recommendations is, is hydrating with, with living sources. I'm really big on that. Um, whether it be coconut water or fresh juice, but I am a huge advocate for, for juices and stuff because plain water is great. And obviously like there, are, you know, there's a need for that. Um, our body does need plain water, but it's, it's not alive. And unless you're going to go down to like a stream or something and get the water that's moving, like the water's kind of dead and there are things you can do to revitalize it. You can add some lemon to it and things, but I think drinking fresh juice or having some coconut water straight from a coconut is one of the best things too, you can do for your health and getting that hydration that's alive and your cells are able to absorb it. And especially coconut water, cause it's like 99 identical to human plasma. And that one, I'm like, if you can somehow figure out how to get coconut water into your daily diet would be like a game changer as well. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Yes, yes, yes. And in fact, in, in Bali, that's got to be one of the best perks about Bali is like, oh, I bet. between <laughs> me, me and my my five kids and my wife, we have we get like, um, I don't know what's the math off the top of my head, but five one and a half liter bottles a day. <laughs> Amazing. we're just like crush, so crushing amazing. coconut water i uh, love it yeah it's super amazing and then like you were saying about the the living water also is like my my um other career is that i'm actually what's called a biologic builder and so the what the based upon um the site selection the material selection and the geometry we build our structures with we're able to increase biologically beneficial charge in the spaces and we can measure it with electro de electrical devices and also more efficiently germinate seeds inside of our spaces compared to conventional spaces 
And so we okay. study, we also make water vortexing devices. And uh, so this is like a big passion of mine. And like you're saying, it's like whenever you have water that's stored away from its natural source for not even a very long period of time, it it literally loses all of the stored charge, like all these electrons and ions, it get, loses these charge and the structure of the water collapses. So it's like normally supposed to be like this perfect hexagonal geometry. It collapses, the surface tension increases, you can't absorb it as well. And so whenever you get living structured water, and that can be from fruits, from coconut water, direct from a spring, from straight from a vortex or some other, you know, if you want to go down the technology route, pops those uh, those hexagonal molecules back out, reduces the surface tension, and it's just so vital. You actually absorb the, not only does it hydrate you more uh, efficiently, but it actually, you absorb the charge, this living biologic charge that's all around us all yeah. the time. And it goes into your aura. And I know like we're, we're in the, like talking about science, but the aura is just the, the woo woo word for the weak electric field around the body, which is yeah. measurable. It's total science. And uh, yeah. so living foods, living uh, waters, uh, living hydration is in time and nature, moving the body, you know, all of this is just paramount to, to holistic health. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. And, and yeah, you're, you, you know, to kind of go off what you said, as far as like, you know, all the po like the positive charge of living foods and things I had recently shared on social media, a quote from like Dr. Morris. And it was, he basically said that like fruit is like the highest, like, you know, vibrational food that you can consume like living food and um you know I, I i do have a lot of people who eat meat who follow me and i was like all right they're gonna come for me but i, I think what's so cool is people who even eat meat will tell me that you cannot deny the the positive energy and the living you know life force that is in fruit and that you know meat just isn't that and then it's like they know it and they can feel it in their body and i think that that's very remarkable yeah absolutely Absolutely. Well, I mean, what else is there to say? Like, we just kind of like knocked it out I of know. the park, I think. Yeah, that's yeah. incredible. So, the, I mean, the last question, I guess, is uh, what, what's the best way to contact you? Yeah, so you could um, reach out to me on Instagram if you want. Again, my handle is TD underscore nutrition, or you can send me an email at TD nutrition coaching at gmail.com either way. Um, but yeah, no, like you, I'm pretty I'll active. Put your stuff, yeah, I'll put your stuff in the description also. Perfect. Great. Amazing. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you and maybe down somewhere down the line, we could do like a Q and a or something like that. Like have some people follow up and ask some specific questions. Yeah, though, no, that would be awesome. But no, this was great. I'm glad we, I'm glad we got to do this. So, cause like you said, yeah, we're so much on the same page, but like, yeah, we say the same things, but in our own way. And it's, it's very cool. It was a great, great conversation. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for joining the Plant Ninja podcast. Thank you, Taylor, for joining me today. It's been a pleasure. And thank uh, you. Yeah. We'll look, look forward to talking to you, with you again soon. Bye.